Okay, um, so I'll try and give an overview of um, Julia itself as a language, uh, and then a bit about the data science -y aspect of it, uh, what we've got and where we're headed, and then sort of how we can interact with other software, in particular Python and R, I guess, are the two main ones people are interested in for data science work. So what is Julia? Um, oh, sorry, I should start. Firstly, I, I work for Julia. I used to be at UCL um, until six months ago in a status, as a statistician. Uh, but now I work, I work for Julia Computing full time, which is sort of like consulting. Uh, so the company started by the founders of the language to provide consulting, support. Um, we've got some products coming out as well. But sort of that's sort of our main income stream is funding the development of the language as well. So Julia, um, sort of the four words we like to throw about. Uh, so it's a modern. High performance language for technical compute, um, dynamic language for technical computing. Uh, so modern, basically, we've tried to learn the lessons of the last 60 years. Uh, high performance, so we want to say our aim is to be as fast as any other fast language. So as fast as your Fortran, your C++, et cetera. Um, so anything, you know, what people typically view as fast languages. By dynamic, we want, I mean, the definition of dynamic language is a bit vague, but we basically mean it's easy to use, as straightforward as Python, as your Pythons, your R's, et cetera. And then finally, technical computing. So our core target is technical computing. Um, you can use for other things, but basically anything involving numbers or arrays of that sort of thing is basic. That's what we're really focusing on for. Um. So why, Julia? Uh, fundamentally, if you want to write fast, efficient code in a very easy to use, elegant, dynamic language. Um, and so our original sales pitch is that you avoid this two language problem where you have to have your, all your high level code uh, and then you sort of your nice bit of code and you have to ch chuck out, uh, convert all the inner loops into C to make it fast. Um, so we're trying to say you can just use the one language for everything. You don't have to do this, um, you know, rewrite bits and I don't know if you've I, I come from using R before a long time ago. So you, you know, you, if you ever dug into R functions, if you type the function into the command into the REPL, it gives you the function. But then, if you dig down far enough, eventually, it just gives you some calling some C library underneath. Um, and so, yet, you know, basically, the idea is you can all, um, you do this. And because of that, it's very easy to peek under the hood. So you can most of Julia itself is written in Julia. Um, there's remarkably little of it is actually written. Basically, the only bits that aren't are the bits that tie into the LVM backend, uh, which is the compiler that we use, exploit. Uh, and so you can actually view, actually dig all the way down to see where how your code goes. Um, but not only that, you can also view the stages it goes from the code you type the code you're using down to what it actually goes all the way down to the machine level code that's being executed on your machine. Um, and so this is great for someone tinker like me or someone who like, who one of those people who like really likes to understand what's going on. Uh, it's great, especially when you're trying to make your code faster because you can see exactly where the bottlenecks are and you know, how you can make it faster. Um, it's free, basically, I don't think you could realistically come out with a programming language these days that isn't free and open source, like no one, who's gonna take you up on that? Um, <laughs> it's fun. I s it's, I don't know, um, I mean, most people who found Python, like if you come from Python formula, you, you know, Python's got this sort of elegance of, you know, it's kind of neat and it, you, um, you know, it's kind of fun using it. And I think Julia has that as well. And that sort of, you know, you learn, as you dig into it, you realize how neat it is and all these really nice constructions and it's a lot of fun. Um, and finally, it plays nicely uh, with everything else. So uh, I'll give a sort of demo later on of the, uh, how it interacts with R and, it's very easy to call C, and then also very easy to call R and Python, and plays nicely with all existing tool chains, and so you can, and vice versa. Um, so what does it look like? So here's a sort of a nice simple function, log sum x. So uh, as you can see, hopefully that's fairly obvious what it's doing. Basically, this is the you know, standard if you've ever done have to take the sum, the log of a sum of exponentials. This is what so the code you would end up writing would look like. Uh, so there's a couple of things going on. Firstly, you notice we, unlike Python, um, use n to n blocks. So we stole that from MATLAB. So, um, so, there's, so there's no significant white space. So it means you can copy paste code without having to worry about indentation. Um, but you know, any editor will indent it for you. Uh, what else? Uh, for i equals one to length, so we're one-based indexing. So if you can live with that, for some reason, a lot of people, most data people don't care, but you know, for some reason, you know, hardcore CS people really have this abhorrence of one-based indexing. But you know, I don't care to be honest. But yeah, if you can live with that, it's fine. Uh, 
instead of having your range objects, you have this, uh, like Python, you would have a, for i equals range, you have one to one colon length. So again, we've stolen that MATLAB R notation. But unlike those, we don't, act, that doesn't allocate a vector, that creates an object, which is just like an iterator, similar to x range in Python 2 or range in Python 3. Um, yeah, so that's the sort of thing, you, it, I mean, it looks fairly obvious, and there's an implicit return at the end. Um, so, you know, it's fairly, ob hopefully, that looks fairly straightforward. If you're a py written Python code, you'd see how you get that. Um, so as I said, very, m probably more heavily instant from MATLAB, but we got rid of all the stupid MATLAB quirks, like RAN 10 doesn't give you a matrix, 10 by 10 matrix, it just gives you a vector, which, so we tried to fix all those stupid things. Um, but then we also, yeah, install some good ideas from Python along the way. So basically, if you're a MATLAB or a Python user, you should pick it up within a day or so, playing around with it. Um, so that's what the language looks like. So what, how does it work underneath? Uh, so the fundamental idea, and I think it's probably more important, so Python classes are sort of, you get to them after a while, learning Python. Types are probably more important to Julia than classes out of Python, uh, more fundamental. Uh, so again, like a class in Python, every object has a type. Uh, so the type of a 1.0 is a float64. Uh, functions have types, so a type of a function is a function. And, a type, and then types themselves are all subtypes of data type. Are all of da type data type, sorry. Um, and so you de declare new types with the type keyword. So type, this declares a type with two float64 arguments. Uh, and then you can construct it by just passing those two arguments in. Um, and so something that's fairly unique about Julia is that user declared types are as efficient as the built-in types. Uh, so if you basically, uh, it would be our complex type, for example, is defined in Julia itself and is as fast as you would, you know, if you call Fortran complex code. Like it's basically everything you can do is you can, anything you can make fast, you can make fast just using Julia. Uh, and so built-in types are as fast, like base, and then are as fast, you don't have to worry about them being sort of second class citizens. Uh, and so, and they also then mirror C struct, so it's nice, you know, it's nice to play if you have to call C objects. Uh, so that makes it very easy to use. The other core idea, uh, so this is a bit of a leap, um, and so if you don't follow this along, uh, I, I, don't, I apologize, but I'll try and give a flavor of what makes Julia special, um, is multiple dispatch, Gen generic functions and multiple dispatch. Um, so, uh, Julia functions are generic, and so basically different code paths will get called depending on which, uh, what, the, what the types of the arguments are. Uh, and so firstly, we don't have the distinction from say Python is that the functions don't belong to a class. So uh, methods don't belong to a class. They're separate, they're sort of orthogonal objects and they don't, there's no sort of, um, we separate them out a bit. And so you always call a function by f so the function at the front and then parentheses to call the function. Uh, the, and so here I've defined a function f with two methods. Uh, the first one is a float, 60, if it has a float64 argument, it, prints, it returns a string. Uh, and so dollar does string substitution as in Python. And uh, if it's an int, it says it's an integer. So fairly straightforward. Uh, basically, um, this is, uh, before I, when I wrote a function, I used function space. So basically this f equals is like a shorthand version of that function declaration. So uh, it's great for when you have to write one-liners, which um, when you start playing around multiple dispatch, you find yourself writing a few, a few more methods, uh, quite a few methods. Um, and this double colon is a type specification. Uh, and this is entirely optional. This is only used to determine, this doesn't affect performance, it only determines uh, what we call dispatch. So which, arg which method will get called from a particular function. Uh, so, if we'd, um, so if we hadn't left that, if we left the x off altogether, we could have just written the first one without, uh, you know, without the double colon there, it would be just the same function. Uh, so when you call it with a float or an integer, it, does, it calls the correct method, basically. Um, so as I said before, unlike standard object-oriented languages, um, we don't take, functions don't belong to a type. So basically why we do this is because we can then take this to the next level and say, why dispatch on the first argument? We can dispatch on any combination of arguments. Um, and so here we've now take two arguments. And so fx, uh, so if the first arguments are float64 and the second arguments are int, we can print this. And now if it's, uh, we have sort of fallbacks, 
So for any real types, so uh, float 64s and ints are subtypes of reals, and so then we just say it's some sort of real, and then for any other object, we just say, I don't know what the hell they are, we'll just print something else. Uh, and so then as we go through these, you can see exactly what gets uh, printed for each combination. So, so for, any, if for any two functions, it will, there, there will be a, some method will get called. And that's what, um, and so you can see that's how it, yeah, so just, it's a very simple dispatch. And so you have to think a little bit clear, it takes a little bit of time to get your head around this, especially when you get such more complicated things. But this becomes really powerful for things like matrix multiplication, because then you can dispatch on what the two type, you know, if you have different types of matrices, like uh, symmetric, symmetric, uh, tridiagonal, diagonal, et cetera, you can dispatch on the ones that best matches the, um, the method that best matches the two arguments you have. Um, and so for example, say we want to show how our baz type is printed. Um, so this is handled by the show function. Uh, so if I type show b, for that b bat was the object I defined earlier, it just prints the output. So as I said, show is itself is a generic function and it has something like 105 different methods. Um, and so you see the first object is, the first art, um, and all these things it takes two arguments. The first one is an IO type, which basically says, where am I going to send it? And the second one is a is the type of the thing we want to print. Uh, so most show met, so as I said, uh, that. Um, and there's also a generic single me argument method, which then just prints it to stand it out. So, which is what, so by default, if we just pass a single object, it'll just print it out as we'd hope. Um, so to extend it, we basically say, we first have to import the method. It doesn't let you override in, uh, built in functions. So you have to Im uh, import the function. So it doesn't let you override built in functions without explicit importing. Uh, and then we then just define a new method and say, say do something like that. And then now when we just enter the object, return the object, it'll uh, print out a nice description, long description. And as I said, yeah, this, this sort of generic idea becomes very, very powerful and uh, it's quite useful unless you do a lot of things that you can't do in sort of a standard class uh, method belonging to a class type infrastructure. Um, so that's sort of a bit of bit how Julia works uh, at the high level. Um, so how does it work underneath uh, and what makes it tick? And fundamentally, one of these things, uh, there's sort of two things going on. Uh, the first one is just-in-time compilation. And so basically, whenever you call a function uh, the first time with a specific uh, set of types as arguments, it will just in time it will just in time compile it. Uh, so generate all the necessary machine code then to actually call the function. Um, and the way it does this is use this uh, what's known as LVM, which is a basically a backend compiler infrastructure. So it's used by Clang, um, famously is the most. So if you use compiling C programs on a Mac, um, then that's what it's been using. Uh, now Rust and Swift have also adopted it. And it's basic, it's great. Basically, we can take, it leverage all this work done by fantastic compiler engineers and uh, implement ourselves. I think we're the, one of the few ones you actually use in the JIT stuff, so we had to sometimes push quite a few patches up to get that working. But, you know, and it also then lets us use it, makes it incredibly easy to operate cross platforms and also on new machines. So to get the ARM build working was probably a couple of days work by one person. Just so entirely new architecture basically just was pretty straightforward because I had all this machinery in place. Um, so, as I said, so functions are just compiled. So that means that they're the unit at which you want to build things. So um, first time people write uh, Julia code, they'll just write a script and then click run and then it runs terribly slowly and that's because it's not being JIT compiled. So the first thing you then tell someone is just stick everything inside a function type function at the start and return the value one at the end and then suddenly it all magically becomes faster. And it works quite well. That remarkably works fairly straightforward. Um, and then why does that work is that uh, internally, one of the main tricks that we use is called type inference. So basically that means when it sees the function, uh, your function, it goes through and tries to tag what uh, type of each, the, what the type of each variable and what each expression is. Uh, so it can then figure out what the result is. Um, and so this means that there is a slight trick to writing performant functions, which basically means you have to write them such that they're what we call type stable. And essentially that means is that you don't want the variables to change types as your uh, function. So if you've got a for loop, for example, you don't want to start as an integer and then convert it to a float during the loop because then it's changing type. So the, the type inference stage can't figure out what the variable is. Uh, so for example, this is why, for example, if you take the square root of negative one, 
it spits out an error uh, rather than giving you a complex value back because if it gave, returned a complex value, that means that the JIT stage wouldn't know whether a square root gives you a float, uh, float or a complex number. And so by insisting on a few of these sort of things, um, then we, we can save space. Um, another example of that is we don't have, be so uh, integers, unlike Python, we don't do, um, if you overflow integers, you don't, we don't go into big ints. Uh, we just, well, you can either, depending if you have checking on or off, it'll either throw an error or we'll wrap around purely for speed because it lets us do s things that, just Python, that you simply just couldn't do by having overflow into big ints because you know that if you sum two integers, you're getting an integer back, which is one machine instruction. It's not a machine instruction plus a branch plus an extra chunk of memory you have to allocate for free branch, which basically, so there's a few sorts of, few little things like that where we've had to make trade-offs for performance, but I think by and large, those things are certainly worth it. Um, and the finally, the other trick that becomes really powerful and very addictive once you start doing it is metaprogramming. Um, and so if anyone's, so Julia has a bit of a, although it doesn't look like it, has a strong list heritage as well. So if anyone's familiar with that, basically the idea is that we can, uh, expressions themselves Julia objects. Uh, so if I just stick a colon at the front of an expression, at the front of a um, syntax, you get an expression object. Um, and what this means is that now I can just, is that it lets you manipulate expressions using Julia itself. Um, so macros are essentially functions which operate on expressions. Uh, and transform them. And they're prefixed with this at symbol. Uh, and the simplest one is this at time. So at time basically takes a timestamp at the start, evaluates the function, takes a timestamp at the end, prints the result, and then returns you the actual answer. And so that's what it's done here. So it's time, it's done that, and then it's printed the result, and then returned the actual answer to that expression. Um, and here you can see what's happened with the JIT. So I've run this, the first, I've run this function, this log sum x I defined earlier twice. So the first time it takes 0 0.05 seconds on 100 points um, and allocates about two megabytes of memory because what it's doing is calling the just-in-time compiler, doing all the fun, fun tricks at the back, type inference, JIT compiling, etc., and then returns the answer. The second time, we're down to like fractions, you know, several orders of magnitude lots faster simply because now it's just calling the, when it calls it, it's just calling the native compiled machine code, so straight done. Um, and so we can see what macros do. So for example, there's this macro expand function. So first we have to quote it so it doesn't get expanded, and then we call macro expand, and this is what it looks like. So um, it does a few things, takes a timestamp, also takes a GC um, expression, figures out what the GC is allocating, and then prints the time, and then returns the value at the end. So that, that's what a sort of a simpler example of a macro. Um, and it generates, the reason it has all these things, it's six hashes in there so it doesn't get confused about um, scoping, you know, so you don't have variables that overlap type thing. So there's a few things it does there to be careful. So you, you, know, you can't sort of accidentally call a variable the same thing as the macro does. Um, so I talked about sort of digging down to Julia before, and this is sort of what you can do. So the first stage when you run this type inference, uh, this is what it looks like. So what you get back is this, so this is the code typed macro. And so this gives you an overview of what's actually happening inside Julia when it sees this function. Uh, and so it looks a bit looks a bit crazy and sorry it doesn't really display nicely here uh, but basically what you end up with is Julia syntax sort of Julia-ish syntax so it's a lower level Julia it sort of gets rid of all your for loops and replaces them with go to's that sort of thing um, and then it tags each expression with a um, type so you can see there's like things so it knows an array of it knows that if you pull a uh, element out of an array of float 64's it's a float 64 uh, it knows sort of which symbols are ints etc it knows if you call a log of a float 64 gives you a float 64 back, etc. So it does, it does all those sort of things um, to figure out the types. Uh, and then the next stage is what we call uh, is the LVM intermediate representation. So once it's done that, we then generate a bunch of code in LVM and tell it to go nuts. And so that's when it starts running its optimization passes. Uh, so if anyone's ever looked at LVM, basically you can think of it sort of like as a cross-language assembly type language. So basically it's very simple, you know, uh, each one of the you know, very simple, very, very simple language uh, with inter you know, integer comparisons, bit casts, that sort of thing, um, you know, loading memory, allocating memory, et cetera. Doesn't look terribly exciting. Uh, and then we can keep on going all the way down to code native. So you can actually see this is the machine code that was generated from this function, the pure assembly, you know, what's being actually executed on my machine. Um, okay, again, 
not terribly exciting unless you read assembly, and even then it's not that exciting assembly. But when you're sort of really write, trying to write tight loops, this sort of can be quite useful. So if you can exploit sort of SIMD operations and things like that. Um, so macros are quite powerful. Um, so one really neat use of them essentially allows you to embed sort of domain specific languages inside Julia itself. Um, so a really good example is this jump package. So it basically lets you specify, a, it's an optimization, sort of optimization language in a sense. It uh, lets you specify a uh, convex optimization problem sort of as a declarative language and then uh, has sort of a back end and lets you farm it out to various uh, solvers like Groby, Cplex, et cetera. Or even it's like, I think it's got some inbuilt ones as well. Um, and it also lets you sort of like tag various expressions that you know, can be optimized. Uh, sort of two ones are like inbounds, which just disables array checking, array bounds checking. So you can literally, so you can get sort of the standard unsafe C behavior where if you index out of an array, you just get like random memory back. Um, so I wouldn't encourage it, but it, it lets, you know, when you're really trying to fight for those last few, last few operations, it can get you there. Uh, and the other one is SIMD, which sense, so I don't know if any, anyone familiar with SIMD operations in a processor? Okay, so basically how it works, modern processors, flow, um, basically we could make floating point operations any faster. So what they've done is started chunking, letting you do four pro, um, things at a time. So if you're summing up an array, you don't start, you don't, um, you know, just keep adding floating point numbers together. What you're doing is it, um, the fastest way to do it is to add them, keep, a keep four in your register and then add another four to that and add another four to that and add another four to that. Um, unfortunately, if you write a for loop that sums them up, that's, it can't do that because that's not a valid transformation because floating point operations aren't associated. So what at SIMD says is rather than doing uh, A plus B plus A plus B then plus C then plus D, it says, okay, I'll let you rearrange those plus statements such that you can do those four at a time. And so it just sort of, I'll let you be a, do some, a few things, you, you know, if you be a little bit more generous of what you can do and then you can get these neat, uh, quite fast optimizations. And just like sticking these various things in there is, you know, you can suddenly get quite, uh, quite powerful uh, performance improvements. Um, and so packages. Uh, basically, so Julia has a quite extensive and growing collection of third party packages, 900, over 900, uh, 900 odd. Uh, so you can't quite compete with the sort of the Python ecosystem, obviously, but uh, simply being your new language, but they're, you know, huge range of various things. Uh, and so to install a package, you literally just go package.add within the language itself, and then it'll install it, even download binary dependencies, all that sort of stuff. You know, all the stuff that Conda has recently got on the bandwagon with, we, we can do as well, so uh, it's quite useful. Whoop, uh, what just happened there? Did I? Oh, sorry, that was my fault. Um, Okay, so a bit about uh, Julia and data science. How long have we got left? Oh, we're getting close. Okay, so um, as the name would suggest, distributions is basically a fam uh, library of probability distributions. Um, and so to load a package, you just type using and then the name of the package. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so each class of distributions is essentially its own type. So to find a get, we can define a gamma object, which is a gamma distribution just by feeding in the you know, D equals gamma 3, 2, it gives you a gamma object back. Uh, and so from that, we can construct various things, uh, you know, compute means and variances of the distribution, uh, the CDF of the distribution. Uh, so similar to the SciPy type thing, stats package if you've used that, but similar in a vein. Um, and then random, you know, ran calling rand with the distribution gives you, rather than getting zero, one variables, gives you variables with the distribution, uh, variables in that distribution. Um, and there's a basic estimation functionality as well. If we, you know, fit the MLE, the normal, um, to that random matrix we just allocated, um, it tries to get the, you know, computes the ma you know, maximum likelihood estimator of the normal distribution. Um, but under the hood, it's slightly more powerful in the sense of because we, how those distributions are defined are what we call an immutable type, which essentially means when the uh, computer just sees it as a as a pair of two floating point numbers. Um, and so what essentially this means we can do is sort of all really nice optimizations under the, th under the hood. It can sort of stack allocate these variables, which may sound impressive, but it means you can create, uh, um, you don't have this overhead because of how the just-in-time compiler works, you don't have this overhead of allocating and destroying objects, which would make this sort of prohibitive. So if you want to create new distributions in a loop, um, you know, for example, if you're doing MCMC, anyone familiar with that, you have to, you know, keep, con you know, give sampling, you have to construct new distributions and then sample from it. There's no overhead to creating and destroying those distributions because they're, you know, they're not 
sort of objects that need to create on the heap. They're just, you know, literally just some bits, uh, bits in a register somewhere and then get thrown away when we don't need them anymore. So just the fundamental design of it is, uh, makes it very powerful. It's the same as having just a function that was, you know, calling a gamma, calling the you know, incomplete gamma function. We can call the CDF of the gamma is much, much faster. Um, and the similar things for multivariate distributions as well. Uh, so, for example, uh, we do a few tricks in here. So, like, you know, in the sampling from a distribution, we can sort of do the most efficient thing depending on the matrix, you know, pre-compute Cholesky factors, um, or exploit an structure like diagonal structures. Um, so, for example, diagonal matrix, you can see sort of in its, it knows it's a, if I pass it just a, a single vector in, it knows it's a zero mean with diagonal normal. You know, so it can exploit, it can do the sort of the fast things right there. Um, and then obviously called random of a uh, multivariate distribution gives it an array. Uh, what happened, keeps happening here, sorry. I must keep bumping something, sorry. Uh, okay, so data frames, uh, basically it's similar to sort of data frame in R or pandas in Python. Uh, basically columns of possibly null heterogeneous, uh, so in heterogeneous columns, uh, data structure type thing with possible null nulls. Um, so you can construct it just by passing vectors into a constructor, name vectors into a constructor. Or similarly, um, this is a data macro which lets you stick NAs in the vector and makes them behave nicely. Uh, but you can also pass, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, strings or integers or floating point numbers, you can pass in arbitrary Julia objects. So here I've just created a column of normal distributions. Uh, so we can you know, import uh, this R data sets package, which is basically all the data sets that come with R, various R packages. Uh, so we can load the I standard Iris data set. Um, and then you can do sort of various operations on there. So indexing by a symbol gives you uh, the vector, gives you a column, indexing, uh, usual standard row column indexing. So one column gives you the row of the, of the data frame. Uh, and you can subset by indexing as well. Uh, and it supports this sort of split, apply, combine thing, uh, you know, created by dplyr and panda, has pandas as, as well. So we you sort of just, so by, so we feed the data set, so by a variable species, we apply some function and then compute the result. So in this case, we're computing the mean of, uh, of, a, uh, of another thing, of another variable. Uh, and gadfly is a sort of a plotting library. Um, so it's very elegant. Uh, so using Gadfly, so uh, plot x, you feed the coordinates, x or y, x and y as vectors, and you get a graphic out. And what's particularly nice is the graphic it returns is an SVG with uh, inbuilt um, uh, JavaScript, so you can do like zooming, plotting, uh, zooming and panning, uh, all, all inbuilt. Uh, and it's also static, so this isn't doing anything fancy like calling through to the Julia backend. You can just save this as an image and stick it somewhere and all, all this stuff will still work. Uh, and it's sort of inspired by this uh, grammar of graphics idea uh, we've heard about yesterday as, um, in uh, one of the talks in there, and that, but also and it's used by sort of ggplot2 in R, where, um, and so you can feed in, and it plays nicely with data frame. So we can feed in data frame, a data, this iris data frame, and then, uh, so x and y are the columns, and then color is a column, a species column. And then you can, again, we get this nice graphic back out, which again, fully interactive. Um, and you can specify geometries like lines or histograms, or sorry, density plots there, um, and that sort of thing. And it's got all sorts of other things. You, know, you can set scales and you know, log scales and uh, value, uh, that sort of thing. GLMs, uh, generalized linear models. We're short on time, so I'm going to skip this bit. Um, but yeah, generalized linear models, as you'd expect. Yeah, I'll do a little bit more to want to talk about at the end. Uh, and finally, the other thing I want to talk about is, so that's sort of, yeah, various other things for, um, you know, a few other sort of uh, interesting things. So, you know, various backwards hypothesis tests and density estimation, uh, penalized regression. Uh, wrap, we don't really have a, there's no Julia based deep learning library at the moment. There's MX, we have a, like various wrappers for things such as MXNet, I think is sort of the current recommended one. Uh, and there's this sort of compute framework, which is sort of work in progress at the moment, is to sort of, it's like a DAG based scheduler for <coughs> distributed computing, similar to Dask, basically very similar to Dask in Python, uh, which we heard in the keynote this morning. Uh, basically, uh, finally, calling other languages in Julia is very easy. Um, 
So C is the inbuilt, is obviously very easy to call from inbuilt. Uh, so it's simply just a C call function. Uh, and then you pass the function in the library and then the various argument types and then the arguments. So here I'm calling the power function in the standard C math library. So libm, so that's why libm's there. Uh, I give the return value, return type and then the input types and then pass the two arguments and it just and it calls that <coughs> function underneath. Um, and there's similarly other low level functions. There's C function for creating uh, C compatible function pointers if you need to do callbacks and things and there's unsafe store and unsafe load for literally just pulling bits out of memory. Um, and so it makes it, and then once you combine this with metaprogramming, it makes it very, very easy to wrap uh, existing libraries. Uh, I think it was like one of the first things I did in Julia was, like, was wrap a C library and, you know, literally it took about a day or so to get going. Uh, and then, so based on this, we can then interface with the C functions of other, other languages. So PyCall, for example, wraps Python is based, basically just calling the C Python API via that C call. Um, so PyCall, using PyCall, will basically start a background Python session, uh, which we can then uh, call. So PyEval then just evaluates a string as Python in Python, uh, and then converts the result back into Jul a Julia object. So PyEval, we call it for like, you know, Python, uh, evaluating Python range uh, and Python uh, uh, symbolic Python list, and we get back a Julia array, which is sort of the corresponding object. Um, there's this nice pi import macro which basically creates, um, a, loads a Python module into a, basically creates a corresponding Julia module and uh, wraps all the functions nicely. So at pi import math loads the Python math library uh, and then we can call math.sign, it's actually a pi object, so it's just a wrap around the Python uh, sign function and then which you can just call straight away. Math.sign of 0 0.2 gives a, um, so it's calling the Python sign function and then returning the result back. Um, obviously, we have our own built sign function, but that was a <laughs> so you never really want to do that. But for other libraries, it's useful. Um, if there's not a matching Julia object, it just returns a pi object containing a type, which you can just play around with and then pass back to other things. Uh, so, for example, if I create pi import the decimal module and const pass a, uh, construct a Python decimal, I get this pi object decimal um, back. Uh, which, but I can still use that at even. Um, back with, through PyCall. Uh, so Julia doesn't support overloading dot, the dot operator yet. Uh, and so to call, um, you know, what were to call uh, d dot two integral, you have to call, use a somewhat clumsy thing of uh, using the square brackets to integral and then evaluating that. So, uh, and that computes the, you know, essentially is computing this Python expression. Uh, NumPy arrays, so NumPy and Julia use exactly the same memory layout, so you can actually uh, convert directly between them. I think um, one of the ways it actually doesn't even bother allocating the memory, I think it's the Python, if you've got a Julia array you pass it to Python, I don't think it even, I think it just keeps the, um, just calls the Julia memory, so it doesn't even have to copy it, um, which is quite nice. Um, so Py input memory. You can also pass Julia functions back into Python and then Python can then call those. So for example, here we call scipy.optimize. Uh, by Newton iterations, here we're passing this Julia function uh, back into the scipy Newton method, which then, then about optimizes that and gives you the, uh, I guess that must be the maximum? Maximum or minimum is scipy, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, that's the, uh, so yeah, very straightforward to use. Uh, and then there's a separate package called pyplot, which is essentially pycall on matplotlib with a few nicer wrapped functions. Um, so using pyplot, um, and then we can just call basically the same matplotlib syntax you would use. Um, I have to stick pyplot out here because I've already defined a plot function when I loaded uh, gadfly. So if you're not using both libraries at the same time, you, this would just be plot. So um, it's just you know, simple namespacing. And then, yeah, I get my matplotlib graph out. Uh, so R call is the other one, I'll just give you a quick overview. So this is one I've had more result for, uh, more input on. Um, so R import is basic, there's an R import function, which is, so it does the same thing, it starts with a background R session. There is an R import function, uh, which is similar to pi import, but it's not as easy to use, basically because R has completely bonkers syntax. Um, firstly, it has multiple indexing, the double single bracket and multiple brackets, but then it also has non-standard evaluation, which um, let's it do all sorts of cool things, like it lets you do the formula syntax and makes ggplot2 all do, do, you know, dplyr do all these really cool things. But it's completely, you know, you know, because it lets you evaluate variables in different scopes than the one that you call them. And so basically, 
basically lets you R do very cool things, but makes it really pain to call from a sort of a very standard language. Uh, so what we offer instead is, so you can use the, or you can use what this what is called a macro string literal. Um, so basically, if you stick a letter out the front of a string in Julia, um, that calls a macro, which can, so is evaluated at compile time and expands out um, into an expression. And so this, what this does is essentially call, um, pass this as an R expression, and then call it. Um, so if you capital R, a string literal, passes as an R expression, and then when it gets to evaluate, it'll evaluate the expression. Um, but we also do a little bit extra, and it lets you substitute Julia expressions in via the, this dollar syntax. Basically, dollar syntax whenever it's not valid R syntax. So, um, for example, if I define a Julia vector here, x equals rand n, and then call R plot with dollar x, um, that's not valid R syntax, so it substitutes that dollar x into, R, passes that into R, and then gives me the R plot back out. So there, I've just plotted Julia variable. Uh, Again, we can do the same thing with um, functions. So we can pass in Julia functions into R and call them from R. Uh, unfortunately, the variable doesn't work. The printing variable printing doesn't work quite as nicely. But I'm trying to figure that, fix that out at the moment. Uh, but still, we can plot we can plot this Julia function in R. Um, and you can do the same things. It lets you call all sorts of standard. So this is the same uh, R, li R libraries. So here, I just call load the R library ggplot2, uh, and now I pass a Julia data frame into um, ggplot to then create basically the same graph I created earlier in Gadfly, but in using ggplot. Um, again, very simple to use, just using this um, using this simple R thing syntax. Um, of course, you sometimes want to get your results back. Uh, oh, we can do linear models as well. Um, but then, so oh, in each case, so if we did a linear model, what I get is this R object expression, basically because because R and Julia don't really match up as nicely as Python does. We don't convert them automatically back. Uh, so what we do get is this R object back. But then there's this R copy function, which basically just copies it back into Julia as a whatever is the best matching type. So it does a few different. There's a rough here. You can sort of specify a type to copy it as, or it'll try and figure out a best one. So for example, um, R object here, the linear model is really just a named list. So it just converts it back into a dic into a dictionary, and then. You know, so I get an R dic so I get a Julia dictionary back if I R copy that model back. Um, and there's various other interfaces. Java call, you can call LVM, write your own LVM intermediate representation yourself. And you can actually do inline assembly that way if you're really keen. So yeah, inline assembly in a dynamic language, that's fun. Uh, and CXX uh, is the new version 0 0.5. You can actually write inline C++, which is then JIT compiled using Clang because we share the same backend, uh, and then Evaluated, so you know you can literally write C, write C++ at your command line, and then it'll be all nicely evaluated. You know, gets compiled and run. Uh, so future directions. Um, so, so we got some a grant by the Moore Foundation, basically improve this sort of data science, further build on this data science infrastructure. Uh, so we're looking to build like a more convenient data manipulation front end, similar to Dplyr or Link type things. Um, basically, lots of stuff, uh, and then also improve the data analysis thing. So we've got this compute framework. So we really want to build on that to. Uh, Make it easy to distribute com computations and uh, different backend uh, support different backends and that sort of thing. Uh, quietly, quick plug: Julia 0.5 is coming out in the next month or so, so this will have some of those cool new features if anyone's keen. Uh, and then JuliaCon in the uh, yeah in a month or in a month and a half in Boston if anyone's up for a trip or if you're not, I'm sure there'll be plenty of talks online afterwards you can watch. Uh, thank you. I'm probably Kind of the, uh, oh. That didn't work as nicely as I hope. Anyway. Yes? If you refer, so if you, uh, so if you load a NumPy array into Julia, how, where, how do you use indexing work? So if you wrote, um, if you use the, uh, if you copy it into Julia, then Julia just sees it as a Julia array. Like it acts exactly the same as a Julia array, so it uses one based indexing. If you call the Python index, Python get index, what's the Python, if you call Python, what's the function it overloads to get, overload to get indexing? Um, if you call the actual Python indexing function, it will be zero based, yes. Yeah. yeah. There is actually, an, so you can actually overload, change the indexing yourself, um, but out of spite, no one's created a package to do this. Instead, they created, someone created a two-based indexing package. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So you can actually, if you really want, you can change it to want zero based indexing yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, so this was all, so the standard, so this is, these are all inbuilt packages um, and built from the inbuilt package manager. Uh, so basically package, this is a package, inbuilt package manager comes with Julia and then you can install packages from there. Um, and there's 900 odd packages on package of Julia. Lane. Not really, but the easy, you, all you have to do is if you change the environment variable when you start Julia, you can just point a different package directory and that's, it's, um, it's slightly inefficient in the sense of it downloads all the new binary dependencies again. So we're trying to improve that at the moment, but it's, you get the same functionality as you do with virtual and literally by just changing the environment variable. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. I mean, this is what it's saying. The definition of a dynamic language is ridiculous, but basically we're dynamically, it's dynamically typed, but it acts like, I mean, the idea is it acts like, you can statically type it if you really want to. You can stick type assertions everywhere. Um, but uh, yeah, the type inference is like fills in for this that lack of static typing. So <laughs> dynam it's dynamically typed, and then the type inference turns essentially turns it into statically typed language itself. I mean, you can, but it's not it's not impl like the style isn't really written for functional programming. You can write functional programming. There's like a lazy fun thing. There's a lazy .jl which like makes it really easy to write lazy like lazy evaluation and iterators and things. So you can do it, but generally it's just easier to write the standard imperative. I mean similar to Python in the sense of you can do lazy you know functional programming in Python, but yeah. <laughs> it's really an imperative language. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you don't get a warning yourself, but there is a macro called code warn type, which will essentially does that uh, that code type thing I swayed, and then the ones you uh, have changed prints them all in red. <laughs> so yes, you, you can get the same because they're generic functions. It doesn't actually know what the types are until you actually call it. So you have to, it has to do you know, but it's probably something you could add by linter. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so it's quite, we've got quite a good usage in academia because um, basically a lot of people go, have their simulations, um, they're just not, you know, simulations or big models, they're not fast enough and so, especially coming from MATLAB um, is a big popular thing. Um, it's very easy to sell to MATLAB users because no one likes paying for license fees and MATLAB is obviously a t terrible, not a great language. Um, so it's actually very easy to sell. R is pretty easy to sell as well because we've got this, uh, you know, be, you know, perennially R is always slow so it's easy to, Coming from R, it's very easy to sell to those as well. Um, Python's a bit tougher because Python actually itself is a fairly good language, um, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of packages in Python that can get you around the slow bits, and so you know like number and that sort of thing. Um, so there are, I mean, we do have number obviously is a, you know can only really do sort of tight loops. We, we we can go beyond what number can achieve and those sort of things, but generally there's enough hack there's enough things in Python and huge ecosystem you can usually find something that will fill a gap. So yes, I'd like to try it, Julia, but um, and you know, we, we're coming after you, but it's uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, that's a thing. Any other questions? I think I've probably gone over time. So, yeah. right. Thanks.